Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Jaydeep Prabhu. I'm a professor of uh, marketing at the Judge Business School in Cambridge. I grew up in India where I studied engineering as an undergraduate. I then went to the States and switched to business. I got a PhD in marketing at the University of Southern California. I worked in the US, in the Netherlands, and now in the UK. Throughout my career, I've studied innovation. In the first part of my career, I studied innovation in large Western companies. And then more recently, I've turned my attention to innovation in emerging countries or developing countries like India, where I'd grown up. And when I went to India and talked to people there about how they innovated, I was struck by the fact that their approach seemed different from their Western counterparts. First, they were very frugal in their approach to innovation. They were very good at taking cost out of the whole innovation process and doing more with less. Second, the mindset was very flexible. They were very good at improvising and thinking laterally. And finally, many of their solutions seemed inclusive, designed to bring people who are outside the formal economy into the formal economy. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Now this is an example, a bit of a caricature, of what innovation may look like in an affluent society. This is a high-end fridge that will talk to you and you can talk back to via that tablet PC. And for that pleasure, you pay about $3,000. Now, as I said, it's a bit of a caricature, but you often see this with large companies. They have R&D budgets. They spend a lot on technology, often for the sake of technology. They then put that into their products to differentiate them, and they charge the customer for it. Now, in India, you might see things like this, but you're equally likely to see something like this. This is a $30 clay fridge. It uses the cooling properties of water in the reservoir at the top to also keep fruit and vegetables in the box at the bottom fresh for up to five days in a hot climate. Now, the person behind this um, was very frugal. He's used just clay and water. The mindset was uh, very flexible, lots of improvisation. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. And his solution is designed to be inclusive. He was from a village in an Indian, the Indian state of Gujarat. And his objective was to bring a fridge to millions of people who'd like to have a fridge but cannot afford one. And even if they could afford one, may not have access to electricity. Now here's another example. This is an incubator. Uh, from a company like, say, GE. It's a beautiful machine. It has all the bells and whistles. But it costs about $20,000. And at that price, it's really beyond the reach of many people in countries like India, particularly those in the countryside. Uh, the health centers there cannot afford these machines. Even if someone gave it to them, they may not have electricity or someone to maintain the machine. Now, in a situation like that, something like this could be very powerful. This is only about $20. Now, it's not an incubator. It obviously doesn't have an oxygen tent. It's a baby warmer. But it's designed to address a large part of the problem that incubators address, problem of infant mortality, when infants are born one or two weeks prematurely. They're not able to maintain their body temperature and may die. And this will prevent that. Interestingly, this was designed and now marketed by four students, uh, former students at Stanford, who took a course called Design for Extreme Affordability, and the objective of the course was to come up with a working prototype that was 100th the cost of the existing solution, and they took incubators. I'll tell you more about them in a minute. Now, I spoke to literally scores of such innovators who are applying things like this in India, and when I asked them how they would describe this frugal, flexible, inclusive approach to innovation, they often used this Hindi word, jugaad. So my co-authors and I then use that word uh, in the title of our book, Jugaad Innovation, where we define this sort of innovation as the art of overcoming harsh constraints by improvising an effective solution, a good enough solution, not a perfect solution, but one that uses the limited resources that are available. And when we were researching this book and blogging about it on the web, Several people from other parts of the world wrote in to tell us, oh, you know, we have something similar in our country. Uh, the Brazilians told us there were two related words that they used to describe this kind of approach. Uh, and we saw examples in other developing countries, but also in the West. 
So in the book, what we did was we looked at scores of examples, and then we tried to extract some principles we thought that guided this kind of innovation. The first principle is that these innovators are very good at finding opportunity in adversity. They turn adversity on its head. Necessity becomes the mother of invention. Second, they're very good at doing more with less and taking resources that are abundant to them and using them to neutralize the effects of scarcity. Third, the mindset is very flexible. There's a lot of lateral thinking. If they can't climb the mountain, they find ways around it. The solutions are often simple. This helps to conserve resources, but also makes it easy to apply the solution, to adopt the solution, to maintain it. Very often, they're including marginal people, not only as consumers, but often as part of the solution. And finally, these innovators are deeply passionate about what they're doing. They're willing to persevere in the face of odds, and they need to be able to do this, because often what they're trying to do is quite hard. So let me just tell you a bit about the entrepreneurs we featured. This is Mansukh Bhai. He's the person behind the clay fridge. He has a high school education. He comes from a family of potters in a village in the Indian state of Gujarat. In 2001, there was a very serious earthquake in Gujarat, and lots of people lost uh, their property, their household possessions, including the clay pots in which they traditionally store water. And one morning, he opened the local newspaper, and he saw a picture of someone's clay pot that was broken, and the caption read, poor man's fridge broken. And from that, he actually got the idea to make a poor man's fridge. He set up a factory in his village. He trained local women to make these fridges. He sells them on the internet. And he's gone on to do other things, like nonstick frying pans made of clay, uh, and water filters made of clay. In many ways, he embodies these six principles I mentioned. In the adversity of an earthquake, he found an opportunity to do something creative. His solution is simple. He learned how to do more with less using clay and water. There was a lot of lateral thinking and improvisation. He included marginal people, not only as consumers, but also as employees in his factory. And finally, he's deeply passionate. He really believes in what he's doing. You can see him talking about this stuff on the internet. Now, here's another example, a very different sort of uh, innovator. That's Dr. Mohan you see up there. He's a diabetes specialist in the Indian city of Chennai. He has a, unfortunately, diabetes is a problem in Indian cities. He has a very successful private practice in the city where people can pay for his, um, for his service. But he's also aware that diabetes is a problem in the Indian countryside, um, and where many people may not know what diabetes is, they may not know whether they have it. Even if they know they have it, they don't know what to do about it. They're not likely to go to the city, which is far away. It takes time, and it's expensive, and they're intimidated by city hospitals. And equally, his doctors in the city are not going to go to the village. So he's come up with this solution, a mobile diabetes clinic. He worked with the World Diabetes Foundation that gave him this van and the equipment in the van. He worked with the Indian Space Research Organization that gave him the satellite dish that you see on the top of the van. The van goes from village to village. It stops. People like this lady from the village will step in. Uh, she looked through the eyepiece. The image is broadcast via satellite to the doctor sitting in the city who can see it on his computer screen and make a diagnosis. He can then communicate that to this person who's a local health volunteer. People like this, Dr. Mohan has identified from village communities. He takes them to the city for a few days, he trains them, and then they go back to their communities. And they help as a liaison. They know when the van is coming, they bring patients in, they take instructions from the doctor, and then they follow up with the patient. So this solution is a very powerful one. It's a charity. He doesn't charge people, although he knows he could charge small amounts to people like this, and they'd be willing to pay it. And he doesn't pay them. They're volunteers. Currently, they're happy to be volunteers because they get training and skills. Here's a different example of an entrepreneur, also from the state of Tamil Nadu. This is the story of Dr. Govinda Venkataswamy, also known as Dr. V who in 1976 set up Arvind Eye Hospitals to address the problem of cataract blindness in India. This is now a massive network of hospitals that has treated over 35 million patients and has performed over 4 million surgeries, many of which are highly affordable or even free and subsidized by people who can afford to pay. 
Doctors in these hospitals rotate between the free and paid wards. This ensures quality, and quality control is, is a, a priority. The infection rate is around four per thousand, which is lower than international norms. One of the problems they faced was the cost of lenses was quite expensive because they were imported. So they set up an oral lab to actually make lenses on site, and this, because of economies of scale, has reduced the price to less than $2 each. Yet another example from the neighboring state of Karnataka, in Bangalore, my uh, native city, is Dr. Devi Shetty, a cardiac surgeon, uh, who was concerned by the fact that lots of Indians cannot afford cardiac surgery. So he focused on the issue of cost without compromising quality. And he adopted principles of Fordism, uh, issues such as division of labor, specialization, economies of scale. And he set up this very large hospital in Bangalore, a thousand bed hospital that does something like 30 major operations a day. And in the process, he's been able to reduce the price of cardiac surgery to about $1,500, and he aims to reduce it even further to $800. He's taken this model to other cities in India and elsewhere, and has opened a hospital in the Cayman Islands to prove that this can be done in the West. Now, it's not just entrepreneurs who do this. It's also large organizations. Multinationals, for instance, have set up large R&D centers in India, GE being an example. Their largest R&D center outside the US is in Bangalore in South India. And they've been using people there in that center to develop medical devices for the local mass market, particularly people in the rural uh, parts of India, where doctors often have to go from the city on a day trip to rural clinics and return in the evening. So they realized that if they were going to develop, for instance, ECG machines for that kind of situation, the machines couldn't be that big. They'd have to be that small. They'd have to be portable. They'd have to fit in a doctor's bag. They'd have to be radically affordable. They'd have to be portable. They'd have to work on batteries. They'd have to be very robust and light. So they knew what the specification would need to look like. And then they went one step further, and they said, instead of doing it the old way, of doing everything in-house, uh, making everything ourselves, owning the intellectual property, why don't we do what our Indian and Chinese competitors do and use off-the-shelf solutions and work backwards? So for instance, they needed a printer. So they thought about it and said, well, bus ticket printers will do. We'll even use the paper because that will be cheaper. We need a keypad. Well, telephones have keypads, so we can use those components. So they took off-the-shelf components, uh, they applied a quality control standard, and then they had this product faster, better, and cheaper. Uh, it did very well in India. They went on to do something similar in China, and now it has FDA approval and is selling in Western Europe and North America. This is the CEO of uh, GE, uh, Jeff Immelt, who's gone on to say that he believes that healthcare products like this developed in India can be exported to the rest of the world. Some of these models and products have applicability in Europe and the US. Siemens also has a very large R&D center in Bangalore, and they too are using that center to develop what they call smart products. Smart standing for simple, maintenance friendly, affordable, reliable, and timely to market. They have all kinds of medical devices. For instance, uh, this issue of look, uh, assessing the health of the fetal heart, instead of using very expensive ultrasound, they use uh, microphone technology, which doesn't need uh, an expert and doesn't need uh, high maintenance. And they have a whole slew of other products like this. Nokia, for many years, built its sort of global uh, uh, presence in emerging markets by focusing on developing affordable handsets for the mass market. And in the late 90s, for instance, they sent people from Nokia to go and live with people in urban slums in places like Mumbai or Sao Paulo. And these people noticed that even though cell phones were expensive, people in slums were buying them. But they were prized possessions, so they would cover them in plastic to protect them from dust and grime. And people would use the light in the phone to see their way in the dark. So Nokia took these insights and introduced them into the design of this phone, an affordable, reliable phone that also had these features specifically for their target market. And this phone became a huge seller. At one point, it was the world's best-selling handset and consumer electronics device. Now, it's devices like this that uh, um, uh, have proliferated throughout the developing world. So much so, I've read that there are more mobile phones in the world than there are toothbrushes. 
which at one level is somewhat alarming, but at another level uh, is quite empowering because now these handsets can be used to deliver all kinds of services to people who are outside the formal economy. Uh, all kinds of health-related services, but also financial services such as this. This is M-Pesa. This is a mobile payment service that was introduced in Kenya in 2007 by Vodafone's subsidiary Safaricom. And M-Pesa allows people like this lady, uh, who may be living in a village in Kenya, to use a basic feature phone to speak, not only to speak to her son who may have left to work in Nairobi, but also to request him to text money home to her in an emergency. He can text money to her by a text message. He receives it onto her phone using a, a four-digit pin, and then she can go to a corner shop in her village, a mom-and-pop shop, and cash that money. This is a killer application in a country with a lot of migrant labor, where previously they would have to send money through Western Union, which could be expensive, or actually take it themselves. So these are the kinds of things that are possible using what's already there. People already have mobile phones. They're used to texting. And in fact, they were actually already using minutes as a form of currency. And that gave uh, Vodafone this idea. Now, this is a story of Simon Berry, uh, a public health worker uh, who'd worked many years in Africa. And he was intrigued by the fact that you could get a cold Coca-Cola in even the remotest village in Africa, but you couldn't get oral rehydration solution. So he said, well, if you can't beat him, let's join him. So he created this packaging that you see here, this kit, this oral rehydration salts kit. And he designed it so that it could fit in the gaps between the Coca-Cola bottles in a crate. And he thought he would literally piggyback down the supply chain. Uh, and he's gone on to improve this model, but a fascinating example of how if you can't beat the big multinationals, you can join them. One of the highlights of my academic career has been encountering this Bangladeshi NGO, BRAC. BRAC, by some accounts, is the world's largest NGO. In some ways, in Bangladesh, it's a parallel government. Uh, they employ large numbers of people, but reach even larger numbers, not only in Bangladesh, but in several other countries in Asia and Africa. And they're diversified. They have huge primary health programs, primary education programs, microfinance, and so on. They get a lot of aid, but they also cover their costs through their own revenues. And they apply relentlessly many of the best practices from business, including constantly learning, trying out new things, learning from those pilots, and then expanding and scaling. Um, and the fascinating thing is that a lot of their primary health work in villages in almost all the uh, corners of Bangladesh are done by local volunteers, women from villages they select and train and support. Now, since uh, that book came out in 2012, that book was very much about what's happening in developing countries and what the West can learn from developing countries. But since 2012, I've been struck by the interest in frugal innovation in the West for the West. And it seems as if we have a frugal innovation revolution happening in the West as well, partly driven by the financial crisis and its aftermath, where there have been uh, pressures on household budgets and also on government budgets, but also driven, I believe, by the fact that increasingly, small teams of people with limited resources are now empowered in the West to do things that only large companies or governments could do 10 or 15 years ago. For instance, Consider this group of students who left Northwestern University in Chicago when they graduated. They said, let's set up an organization. They called themselves Design for America. And they said, if you want to solve the big problems in the world, you don't necessarily have to go to Africa or Asia. There are plenty in the American backyard. For instance, this problem of hospital-acquired infections that kill something like 100,000 people every year in the US alone. So four of them, two with a design background, one with a business background, one with an engineering background, they said, what can we do about this problem? Well, why don't we start with our neighboring hospital in Chicago? So they went to the hospital and they talked to doctors and nurses, they observed them performing their daily functions, and they realized very quickly, doctors and nurses have every intention of being hygienic. But there are many minutes or moments in the day when they can't actually go to a wall unit to dispense the gel to wash their hands. So they went back to their studio and they brainstormed, a small studio with basic equipment in it. They had some computers, they had the software uh, for design, and they had a 3D printer. And they said, uh, what, what would a kid do? Well, the kid would probably just run his hands along his trousers. 
uh, why don't we just take that wall unit and have it clip on to the doctor's and nurse's scrubs? So they came up with SwipeSense, this little device here, which is basically that dispenser, but it can clip onto your scrubs. Um, and they also designed a little sensor there, which sends a signal to a wall unit every time you run your hands over it, and it records the data. And at the end of the day, the doctor or nurse can upload the data to their computer screen, and they can see how they've done. And they can compare themselves to their own behavior, but also to others, and you can set up friendly competitions and so forth. So this whole process, of thinking of the problem, trying to generate a solution, developing the prototype, manufacturing the product, and then selling it and marketing it was done by these four students using things that are ubiquitous these days. Uh, they used brainstorming and observation to get the idea. They developed the solution in their, in their studio using computers and a 3D printer. When they needed money, they did a crowdfunding uh, campaign. When they needed to manufacture it, they outsourced it. They distributed it online through Amazon, so they don't need a sales force. And importantly, they don't have an advertising budget. They use social media. They've done TED Talks, and this thing has gone viral. And importantly, that's only $3 to buy. This is an example from uh, Cambridge, where I teach, and one of our former students, Evan Upton. Uh, he was responsible for student admissions into computer science in Cambridge. And he and his, co uh, his uh, colleagues had noticed that there was a drop in the number of people applying to study computer science at Cambridge. And also the ones who did apply didn't seem to have ever opened a computer and looked inside it. And many of them hadn't even done coding. So they thought this was worrying. And they said, what if we can develop a computer that's so basic and so cheap, we could give one to all school children, and they could tinker, and if it broke, it wouldn't be a big deal. And they'd have to code to make it work. Um, so they, they, they called it the Raspberry Pi, and they thought they'd sell a few thousand, but on the day that they launched it, their website crashed, and since that time, they've sold several millions of these little computers, which cost about $30. And now they've come out with an even cheaper version, costs about $5. So these uh, little devices, which they thought kids would be interested in, it turns out even more than the kids, it's their dads who are interested in this, and they use these devices to make other frugal devices. So there's a guy near Cambridge who sends up these little Raspberry Pis in a hot air balloon along with some sensors and webcams, and he does do-it-yourself weather reporting. These are the things that are possible with these kinds of devices. This is another example uh, from Cambridge. Again, a student of mine, a PhD student who was a Gates scholar, and he was doing his work with me with BRAC in Bangladesh, and he noticed a problem in public health campaigns. Very often in places like Bangladesh, Doctors will go from the city into the countryside, and they'll find themselves sitting in front of a patient, and they don't know who this person is, and they don't have any medical records, and they need to pull up the medical records. So they asked themselves, my, my student and his team of Gates scholars, they asked themselves, how would the doctor solve this problem? Well, he'd probably have a basic mobile phone which can do texting. So what if we could use the fingerprint of the person as their ID, convert the visual information into text, send that via text message to the district hospital where you could pull up the records and then have it texted back to the doctor so he'd know whether the person's daughter needed the vaccination or not. And from the germ of that idea, they first entered into a competition in Cambridge. They won a few thousand dollars, and they have subsequently been bootstrapping this, working with pro bono, some of the people from Cambridge's top companies, to develop several iterations of this device. They now have a, a million a, a, a pounds of funding from the Gates Foundation, from DFID, and from uh, ARM, which is Cambridge's largest company. They've just finished doing a huge trial in Bangladesh, and they're going on to test this in Nepal and possibly in Africa. Now, we all carry around very sophisticated uh, computers in our pockets that are also networked. This is a group of people from a company that spun out of UC Berkeley called Cellscope. And they've been designing a range of medical devices that leverage the computing power and network connectivity of smartphones. So here you have an otoscope that essentially fits into the audio jack of a smartphone and enables a mother, for instance, to take very high um, uh, clarity uh, photographs of the inner ear of her daughter and then send those to a consultant and expert who may be sitting elsewhere. These devices, they've gone on to do other things like dermoscopes and so on, are a fraction of the cost of the standalone devices. 
And also, this empowers patients themselves and helps with telemedicine. These devices have also become huge empowerers. These are 3D printers. The price has been falling dramatically. This particular 3D printer that's just been launched is only $179. And this brings it within the range and reach of many people uh, in the West, people in homes, people who tinker in their garages. But even if you cannot afford that, you can go to spaces like tech shops or also fab labs or maker spaces. Um, these, are, um, these are like workshops where for a monthly fee, you can get access to a number of tools, not only traditional uh, work tools, but also uh, 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, things that can print out circuit boards and the like. And most importantly, you get access to a community of like-minded people who are also tinkering. You remember that baby warmer I told you about, the Embrace, those four students from Stanford. They had this course, and the objective was to come up with a working prototype that was 100th the cost. And they had this idea of a baby warmer that would be about less than $200. And they thought, what if it was a blanket that the mother could wrap the baby in and even hold the baby? But they realized that wasn't enough. They needed something that would keep temperature fixed for a period of time and do that reliably. So they went to the tech shop in Palo Alto and they were tinkering and talking to people there. And they happened to talk to someone who literally turned out to be a former NASA scientist. And he said, well, have you heard of phase change materials? And they said, no, what are those? And then he said, well, it's a waxy substance. You could put it in a, in a pad and that can be heated either through electricity or to water and will keep temperature fixed for a period of time. So that's a very important component of their solution. And again, something that they got from places like tech shops. This is Jane Chen, one of the founders of Embrace, with a fan who lives in a White House. And uh, speaking of the fan, he's become a fan of this maker movement, this, this movement of ordinary people who are making things, not just software, but are making literally things to solve problems in their local communities. And he says, today's do-it-yourself is tomorrow's made in America. These make affairs are fascinating, are fascinating phenomenon. You see them in cities around the West. I went to the European edition of the make affair in Rome in October of 2015, and it was amazing to see so many ordinary people come to a, a space like this, an open air space, where they came to demonstrate things that they'd been doing in their labs, at home, in universities, and so on. Now, let me just conclude by some thoughts on what does all this mean for large organizations? A lot of the examples I gave you were of entrepreneurs. But what about large organizations? Well, my co-authors and I wrote this book that came out last year, which focuses specifically on what this frugal innovation revolution means for large organizations in the West. And in the book, we say that essentially this is what frugal innovation is all about. It's trying to maximize the value of what you're doing while reducing the use of resources. And the value could be to patients, it could be to shareholders, it could be to society at large. And the resources could be financial or natural resources or time, which may be the most valuable of all. And again, as in the previous book, we looked at lots of examples and we tried to extract some principles we thought that could guide large organizations. And these are the six principles of engaging and iterating with people whose problem you're trying to solve flexing your assets so that you're making best use of the resources you have, including your human resources, your teams, creating solutions that are sustainable, shaping patient behavior, helping people to live healthier lives, for instance, and to actually prevent the problem rather than have to cure it, co-creating value with prosumers, people perhaps that 10% who are already engaged and want to make a change, uh, consumers are not passive recipients of things, but want to be actively involved in the economic process. And working with others who might be more innovative than you. Let me just give a few examples, particularly of the last two. Remember I told you about tech shops, these spaces where you can go and tinker? Well, Ford, the motor company in Detroit, has partnered with Tech Shop in Detroit to allow Ford employees to go and tinker in these tech shops along with people from the local community. And they found that this increased the morale of Ford employees, but it also increased their productivity. They were coming up with more patents and more highly valued patents as a consequence of this relatively small change. This is Beth Comstock. She's the chief marketing officer of GE. And this is a guy called Ben Kaufman, who's a 20-something founder and CEO of a New York startup called Quirky. 
And I find this interesting. This is uh, uh, you know, one of the top people in one of the world's oldest and largest organizations, GE. Uh, she and GE have gone to this relative upstart, this tiny company, to ask them for help with innovation. GE has huge budgets and all the resources in the world. And they're going to the startup. So what do they find in the startup? Well, Quirky essentially crowdsources innovations. People like you and me can go on the an online platform and become part of the community, and we can suggest ideas for home appliances. And then others in the community get to vote. And, and then Quirky selects the most popular ideas to take forward. They will prototype it, they'll test it, they'll manufacture it, and then they'll place it in retail. And the person whose idea it was will get a share of the revenues. So GE goes to Quirky and says, can you help us revitalize our air conditioning line? We haven't been able to innovate this line for ages. As it turned out, one of the people in the Quirky community, Garth and Leslie, had suggested an idea for a smart air conditioner. He would drive to work in Washington, D.C., and in summer, he would see when he was on the freeway all these uh, apartment buildings where people had left the air conditioning units on during the day because they didn't want to return to a hot apartment. And he thought, this is crazy in a, in a world of smartphones where you could control your air conditioner from wherever you were through the internet and your phone. So Quirky took up this idea, and GE and Quirky now jointly market this smart air conditioner that you can control through a smartphone. Final example, this is of a big bank, Barclays, in, in the UK. Barclays realizes that they've lost touch with their customers, and they've lost the trust of their customers. They also realize that they have lots of data on their customers, uh, and that they could be using the data more intelligently in the way that Amazon does. Amazon uses data that on, your, on your own purchases, but also on scores of other people, to give you advice on what books to buy. So similarly, the bank could be giving you advice on how to manage your finances more cleverly and how to meet your own savings goals, and all this through a smartphone app. They have all the resources in the world to do this in-house, but because they're a large organization with silos, with hierarchy, with processes, with a compliance culture, they realize it takes them very long to do it in-house. So they decided to have entrepreneurs help them do this. And it so happens that London is a hub for financial technology startups. So they've created a big uh, warehouse, uh, an open uh, uh, forum, where this company called Techstars houses, at any time, 10 promising fintech startups from around the world. These startups are accelerated in this space. They're there for three months. And they're daily working on improving their business. While they're doing this, they're mentored by people from the main bank. Now, these fintech startups, they're very creative, but they don't know much about banking. So the mentors help them to understand how a big bank works, all the issues of compliance, what the customers are like. And so the fintech startups benefit. But so too do the mentors. The mentors begin to realize the possibilities of technology and how you can do things faster, better, cheaper. And at the end of the 13 weeks, these startups pitch to people from the bank and then they make a decision of whether to incorporate that idea into the bank, invest in it, or pass it on to someone else. So let me conclude. The big challenge for large organizations, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector, is threefold. They're often quite profligate and find it hard to do more with less. They're often very structured and hierarchical and find it hard to be agile. And often, they're quite secretive or closed about how they do innovation and therefore do not include excluded groups, not only within the organization, but outside the organization. So there are at least three things that companies can do or organizations can do to address these problems. As, as Lois was saying, you can create a space for them. You can give them time and space to experiment and tinker like Ford is doing in tech shop with its employees. Or if you can't beat them, join them. Engage with agile entrepreneurs like Barclays is doing in its accelerator in London. Or finally, if you're in the West, in, a, in an environment that is relatively uh, uh, resource friendly, then you can create this kind of mindset by going to emerging markets, to developing markets, and learning from your counterparts there. The challenge for smaller organizations is almost the opposite. They don't have this problem of structure. They don't have this problem of excess resources. They are very good, typically, because they have to be good at doing more with less and doing things quickly. 
But the challenge for them is scaling. And this is where they can partner very fruitfully with large organizations. But then they have to learn how to do that. So in conclusion, I would say that I firm, firmly believe that the world needs this kind of frugal, flexible, and inclusive innovation. I really believe that large and small organizations from the developed world and the developing world can learn from each other, and that by working together, we can improve lives everywhere. Thank you.